Hey, Mike here. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Dark Poutine early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. You're about to listen to a historical episode of Dark Poutine. After episode 149, you will find Scott is no longer with the show. In an effort to maintain continuity and offer listeners as many episodes as possible, we are leaving the episodes in which he co-hosted intact. Thank you. Do you like those loons? I like them. I love them. I love. I those think loons. they're uh, a pretty good addition to the show. Yeah, they had a very Canadian touch right off the bat. I've been doing some bird watching too. Have you really? You got a pair of binoculars and a bird watching book. When you say birds, you mean actual birds? Real birds. Not, oh, okay. Welcome to Dark Poutine. I'm Mike Brown, creator and host. With me as usual is my good friend and co-host Scott Hemingway. Say hey. hello, Scott. Hey, what's cracking, everybody? What is cracking, Scott? Eggs. Eggs. It's almost Easter. Oh, wow. Yeah, see that segue? Here's Tyler from Minds of Madness. Hi, Tyler. The views, information, and opinions expressed during the Dark Poutine podcast are solely those of the producer and do not necessarily represent those of Curious Cast, its affiliate Global News, nor their parent company, Chorus Entertainment. Dark Poutine is not for the faint of heart or squeamish. Listener discretion is strongly advised. We're not experts on the topics we present, nor are we journalists. We're two ordinary Canadians chatting about crime and the dark side of history. Let's get to it. Put on your toque, grab yourself a double-double and an Nanaimo bar. It's time to scarf down some Dark Poutine. Scarf, scarf. <laughs> This is uh, episode 70. So it's not 69? It's no. Mm. I know you wanted to giggle again. Sad face. Thank you to our anonymous Vancouver police officer for sending us toques. Yes. Oh, man. These are sweet. They are very nice. Seriously. They're really awesome. And that was very, very kind of the anonymous VPD officer. Thank you. A reminder for those of you planning to go to CrimeCon but have yet to buy tickets... If you want to see us and you want 10% off your ticket, use our code poutine19 at checkout when buying your tickets on the crimecon.com site. You should really do both of those things. It's going to be a blast, so you want to be there. And we know you want to help us out. We know you want to use poutine19. We know you do. Last week, we had uh, our second giveaway by Alan Warren. Yes, how'd that go? He gave away 35 <sighs> copies of his book this time. This is the nicest guy. He really is. Like, He wow. said 12, and he gave away 35. So 35. He gave 35. It's just, that guy is so cool. He is a cool guy. I'm going to meet him at the end of this month. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. On with the show. Let's do it. This case was sent to me by multiple listeners recently. I had another case planned for this episode, but as I got into this story, I felt compelled to push it up the list. Well, that's a good sign, then. Yeah. On Halloween night in 2011, after being missing for just over two hours, the family of an 18-year-old Armstrong, B.C. woman found her unconscious and bleeding badly near train tracks. Whoa. Although paramedics arrived quickly and transported the badly injured woman to a nearby hospital where a trauma team met them, it was too late. Her injuries were grave, and she passed away the next morning. Oh, I completely remember this one. The woman had not been hit by a train, as the trauma surgeon expected. Someone had done this to yes, her. Yes, yes. As the police investigation began, the community was in shock that there was a murderer in their midst. This is the murder of Taylor Van Deest. Yeah, oh, it's tragic. It is very... Armstrong is a small city in B.C.'s beautiful interior known as the North Okanagan. Yeah, lovely. The city's about a five-hour drive northeast from Vancouver up the number five Coquihalla Highway and about the same distance from Calgary 
eastward. Yeah. The population of Armstrong proper is around 5,000 people, and if you include the surrounding area, that number goes up to about 10,000. Yeah, so that's a small town then. That's yeah, a, that's yeah. roughly the size of Bridgewater, where yeah, I'm yeah. from. Okay. It's not a metropolis, but looks like a fine place to live and raise a family. No doubt. Armstrong is known for its cheese. The cheese factory, called Armstrong Cheese, of course, was founded in 1902 by local dairy farmers and grew into a profitable industry, and Armstrong Cheese is a familiar brand on grocery store shelves, not only here in B.C., but all the way east to the Atlantic provinces. Yeah, not going to lie, it's one of my favorite uh, store-bought cheeses. I like it, too. Their cheddar is particularly yes. good and sharp. Yes. Oh. In summer, to beat the heat, just minutes away are the waters of the beautiful Okanagan Lake, home of the cryptid Ogopogo. Mm-hmm. Swim at your own risk. I was once, I once sang a song as a child for a recording for Ogopogo. I would love a copy of that if you could. Oh, find I don't it. think it exists. A, a friend, a, a neighbor of ours was a musician, and he, there was supposed to be a, a cartoon for Ogopogo, and so he created the theme song, and uh, I was in it. I don't think the show was ever made. Tragic, That's too bad. Tragically. One of the many parks nearby is Silver Star Provincial Park, which offers many beautiful trails for hiking, biking, and horseback riding in summer, and skiing at the Silver Star Mountain Resort, and snowmobiling and hunting in the winter. Beautiful. Armstrong is also home of the Interior Provincial Exhibition late every summer, complete with a parade, barn dance, live music, dizzying rides on the fairway, agricultural exhibits, and much more, ending with the Finning Pro Tour Rodeo Finals. In a small town, that, that's, that's happening. That's going to be a big thing. Again, this reminds me of my hometown, Bridgewater. Yeah. We had the Big X every summer, and it was not the Rodeo Finals. It was the World Ox Pull competition. Whoa, whoa. Yeah, and Horse Pull. And speaking of rural Canada, have you ever been snow, uh, snowmobiling? Yes. Have you? I never have. I've always wanted to. It's awesome. Yeah. So obviously this is not the kind of place until Halloween night in 2011 that an 18-year-old is murdered. Yeah. Sure, people were always cautious, as were Taylor Jade Van Deest and her friends, but what happened that night was unusual and remains so. Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Taylor had just graduated from Armstrong's Pleasant Valley High School in June of 2011 with her twin sister, Kirsty and her closest friends, Zoe and Clay. She was always a bright girl and breezed through school. She found getting good grades really easy. Oh. Taylor was musically inclined and in the high school's jazz band, blues, and junior and senior bands throughout her years there. That's pretty awesome. She was inspired by her music teacher and was truly sad when he left the school. She sounds like a really, uh, like you would, this is what you want, would want your child to grow up to be like. Absolutely. In most photos I've seen of her, Taylor's green eyes and bright, almost impish smile stand out. Framed by her hair, dyed dark with some red streaks. Cool. She was a pretty girl, about 5 foot 4 inches tall and weighed around 125 pounds. She lived at home with her mom, Marie, and her twin sister, Kirsty, and their dog. As far as I could gather from her public posts on Facebook, Taylor was a fun-loving 18-year-old. She liked horror movies. RuPaul's Drag Race, and played World of Warcraft and Solitaire. I think we were just watching RuPaul's Drag Race and before coming And I was playing up. World of Warcraft earlier on. Oh, wow. And I play a game of Solitaire. Wow, know? wow. So you can relate to this girl. Well, I mean, I have, the more I learned about her, I thought, she's the type of girl who would probably end up being a listener today. Oh, geez. something about that really hits. Yeah. Jeez. She just completed driving lessons and was looking forward to getting her license. She was about to get her N. And for those of you who don't know, in BC, a novice driver gets a, a letter N on the back of their car, and they have certain restrictions on their driving yep. for a certain amount of time. It's graduated license. Yeah, so when you first get your license, you have to drive with an N. Mm -hmm. She wanted to get her first tattoo, and she was looking forward to the freedom a job would provide, but she yeah. hadn't decided what she wanted to do yet. Mm -hmm. She was social, and many of her posts between her and her friends are the silly kind sharing inside jokes within their group. Yeah, sounds perfectly normal. She seemed like a really happy person. In early October, posts started showing up about Halloween, of course. Taylor was a bit embarrassed that she wanted to go trick-or-treating. She felt that she was too old. Yeah, but, but it's still, you know... Kid at heart, everybody yeah. wants to do it. She always loved Halloween, and so she and her pals agreed to do it just one more time. 
Taylor's twin sister, Kirsty, had other plans, and this was the first year that the two didn't go out together. Oh. Taylor's final public post on Facebook was on October 30th, 2011, and she asked a question. Zombie or Mother Nature slash Wood Nymph type look? So asking what should she go as. Yeah. yeah. Taylor, true to her love of horror, went with a zombie. Yeah, she would totally be a listener. She worked hard on her costume. She tore up a purple baggy blouse with black outline floral pattern on it, making it look dirty and open more around the neck, chest, and shoulders. Cool. She had on a rumpled white cotton camisole and blue jeans with rips in them. She gave herself a zombie-like pallor with white makeup on her face and shaded around her eyes and mouth as well, making it look like she had some bruises on her face and like yeah, I've a seen zombie. The f- I've seen the photos. So she did a pretty damn good job of it. She had her usually well-coiffed hair just hanging messily over one eye, and to top it off, she used a lot of fake blood, some coming out of her nose, a latex gash on the side of her face, and splashed the fake blood all over her camisole, her neck, and her chest. Yeah, well, that's what you got to do if you're being a zombie. After hours of work, she was ready to go. And although her boyfriend Colton wasn't going out, Taylor texted him saying she'd share her candy with him later. Oh, that's sweet. According to an article by Infotel's Charlotte Helston, she texted her friend Clay saying, quote, Hero Clay, hurry, Zozo is on her way and will meet you at your place, colon, in a big P, which means, you know, stick your tongue out. Oh, is that what, I never understood what that one yeah. was. So. End quote. Learn in here. The air was cool, so Taylor threw on a pink jacket with a white woolly inner lining over her costume before she headed out the door of the family home near the intersection of Colony Ave and Pleasant Valley Road at 5.45 p.m. Hmm. Taylor walked north on Pleasant Valley Road until she came to the shortcut that most of the locals used, the path near the train tracks. Hmm. As Taylor was walking, she texted her friends, sending 10 texts in total over the ensuing 15 minutes between her home and the tracks. Her last text was to Colton at 6.02 p.m., She sent two words, being creeped. She'd misspelled the word creeped with two R's and only one E in the middle. This was unusual for Taylor, typically a meticulous speller, but it indicates stress and a possible hurried text. Oh, geez, what a... That would scare the shit out of me getting that text. No more texts came from Taylor's phone. She didn't respond when Colton messaged her back. Taylor was a prolific text message user. She was known to respond right away unless she was asleep. Mm. This, coupled with the content of her final text, worried Colton a lot. Yeah, I bet. Also, her friends that she promised to meet began to message too. Where was she? She didn't respond to them either. They all began messaging each other, wondering about Taylor's whereabouts. I'm sure pretty quickly they're all starting to get scared. Around 8 p.m., A group of teens who had been walking along the train tracks found Taylor's cell phone. Oh, shit. Taylor's friends, Colton and her mom, were notified of the find, and all of them went out to search for Taylor along her projected route. Hmm. Taylor's mom called the police, informing them her daughter was missing. Other friends were called and offered to assist in the search. This is happening very quickly. Yeah, yeah. Some searched the streets of the neighborhood and others focused on the area near the train tracks. On either side of the tracks of the path was dark and overgrown with bushes, making the search tough going. Yeah, it would have been dark at this point. Yeah. The group persisted, calling out for Taylor, and she didn't answer. At around 8.45 p.m., a small group of Taylor's friends, including her pal Zoe, found her in the brush about 10 feet away from the train tracks. Taylor was barely conscious, lying face down, fully clothed, mumbling but unresponsive. She was having trouble breathing. She appeared to be bleeding, but her zombie makeup and the fake blood made figuring out her real injuries tougher than it could have been. Yeah, no kidding. On hearing about the discovery, Taylor's mom Marie rushed to the scene. Police and ambulance were notified that Taylor had been found and needed immediate help. According to Charlotte Helston's Infotel article, Taylor's friends and family waited with her at the scene for paramedics to arrive. Quote, Helpless, they placed their jackets over her body on the chilly October night. Her mom, a care aide, held her and said, Fight it, you're going to make it. You're going to survive. End quote. Oh, my heart. Oh. A 
police officer who had been assisting with the search nearby arrived quickly and was followed soon after by the paramedics. Taylor was bundled up and rushed to the small Jubilee Hospital in Vernon, 20 minutes south, where she was attended to by emergency doctor Michael Concannon. The doctor examined Taylor quickly. Yeah. The hair on the back of Taylor's head was matted with blood and covered a very large skull fracture. She also had cuts on her lips, bruising inside her mouth, a large gash on one eyebrow and a nasty bruise on her shoulder, indicating she may have been thrown to the ground and beaten. <sighs> There were two angry red lines around Taylor's throat, indicating some sort of lig ligature had been used to choke her. This poor girl. Her pupils were large and unresponsive, which was consistent with a massive brain injury. There was a petechial hemorrhaging in the blood vessels in her eyes, which also indicates asphyxiation. Yeah. By this time, Taylor's condition had worsened. She did not regain consciousness and was intubated as she'd been unable to breathe on her own anymore. Taylor was given a CAT scan which showed such severe brain injuries it told the doctors that her condition was grave. Oh, shit. The doctor informed police officers who'd accompanied Taylor and her family to the hospital that he believed Taylor's injuries to have been due to a brutal assault. Yeah. She also had bruising consistent with attempts to defend herself on her arms and hands. Two of her fingers were broken. This was no accident. Yeah, as if it was a train accident, the injuries wouldn't be specific to just your head and your hands. Were, you, yeah, you'd be covered in much more involved. Yeah. Taylor's fingernails showed material consistent with skin and blood under them. She'd fought her attacker. A nurse with forensic training clipped Taylor's fingernails, carefully bagging the nails and detritus underneath them for evidence. It's pretty pretty good for a small town. Like the, the, these, everybody's right on top of things. Taylor was transported to the hospital in Kelowna during the night as they were better equipped to handle such a severe head injury. Yeah. The efforts to save Taylor were in vain. Taylor Jade Van Dies succumbed to her injuries early the next morning. Oh, God. As Taylor's friends and family wept, her body was sent for immediate autopsy. From court documents, quote, the cause of her death was determined to be a diffuse bleeding in the brain caused by a series of blunt force injuries to the back of her head. The blows to her head left six separate, long, irregular lacerations of the scalp and a comminuted skull fracture. The forensic pathologist who performed the autopsy was of the opinion that the injuries were most likely caused by forceful blows from a heavy, hard object with a linear, elongated shape. He was of the opinion that each laceration was caused by a separate blow to the head. He considered that any of the blows standing alone could have rendered her unconscious. Together, they were probably unsurvivable, even if Miss Van Deest had been attended to immediately after the injuries were inflicted. Uh. Further on, the other major visible injury suffered by Miss Van Deest consisted of ligature marks around her neck. A smooth cord or similar object had been tightened around her neck. The doctor who performed the autopsy was of the view that bruising to deep muscles of the neck showed that the cord had been applied with sufficient pressure to cut off blood flow to the brain and to render Miss Van Deest unconscious. Evidence of a hemorrhage in one of Miss Van Deest's eyes was also consistent with strangulation. The pressure was not maintained long enough, however, to cause death. The pathologist was further of the view that Miss Van Deest had not been rendered unconscious prior to the ligature being applied, as there was evidence of scratches to her neck caused by her own efforts to remove the ligature. Yeah, she was definitely fighting. She definitely fought hard to save her own life. Taylor's friends and family and friends Taylor's family and friends were left to grieve their sudden horrific loss. Her obituary appeared Taylor's obituary appeared on the Vernon Morning Star newspaper website the next day. Quote, Taylor was truly loved by many. It was the people closest to her heart that had the privilege of knowing what a beautiful, gifted, witty, and loving young woman she had become. Taylor hadn't yet decided on a career choice, but she would have made us all proud whatever path she would have traveled. She will be missed by all of us. A special thank you to Colton and Zoe for sharing our final moments with Taylor. She felt your love. End quote. Oh, shit. Talk about the spread trauma there. There's a lot of people impacted just by being at the site when she oh, was yeah. finding her. 
Well, and also the trauma of the community. We all know how that yes. is as yes, well yes. with the murders that have happened around here. Taylor's public memorial service was held at 7 p.m. on November 7, 2011 at Hassan Memorial Arena at 3315 Pleasant Valley Road in Armstrong. Many paid their respects to the much-loved teen. Mm. As many in Armstrong started to look sideways at one another, wondering who was responsible, RCMP began their investigation. There was a murderer to catch. Damn right. The neighborhood was canvassed as many houses backed onto the railroad tracks on both sides. Mm, okay, that's a good place to start, yeah. People had actually heard screams around the presumed time of Taylor's attack. One woman was checking on her Halloween pumpkins when she'd heard two screams. She thought to be female, coming from the area of the tracks. A friend who'd been visiting the woman confirmed hearing a scream, but both shrugged the screams off as Halloween antics. They were both horrified that they may have heard Taylor's last cries for help and didn't act. Well, as she mentioned, it's Halloween. You're typically going to hear a lot of sounds that you don't normally hear. Fire, crackers, can be confused with gunshots. And I've heard many screams on Halloween. Oh, everybody's wanting to scare everybody. Yeah. So, yes, screams are in plenty. Police released a photo of Taylor dressed in her Halloween costume along with the photo of the jacket she was wearing. They hoped someone would remember seeing her near the time of her disappearance. At the same time, a roadblock was set up near the site of Taylor's attack where forensic technicians still combed the area for evidence. Well, they still have to figure out what tool was used to kill her. The hope was that anyone who'd driven through the area at the time of the attack might stop and have seen something and tell the police at that time. So they wanted to do it while it was fresh in people's memories. Absolutely. RCMP held a press conference on November 3rd, 2011 to inform the media of the progress of the investigation. Here's some audio of that press conference. First off this afternoon, I would like to start by saying we still do not have a suspect in this case. We are following up and will follow up on every lead the public has provided us. The forensic autopsy was conducted in Kamloops yesterday. The results of the autopsy are considered holdback evidence in the interest of preserving the integrity of this investigation. In some cases, we are able to provide some details of the death. In this case, investigators feel it is in the best interest not to release any information. The reason is this. Right now, the only people who know the full details of this death are the pathologists, a few investigators, and the person or persons responsible for the crime. As all of you in the media are aware, the criminal justice system holds into account all aspects of a police investigation. That includes media coverage of a major event like this homicide. The investigating officers and myself are sure you as professional media outlets would not want to release any information that would compromise the integrity of the investigation in any way. The RCMP is doing everything possible to bring this case to a successful conclusion and bring the person or persons responsible to justice so the family and the community of Armstrong can begin the healing process. Wow. Yeah, some really good police work, it sounds like, right off the bat there. You know... Not that I would expect anything less, but small towns might not have the experience with these kind of cases, and so they sound really on top of things. And they did also bring some investigators from the Lower Mainland in to assist, Mm -hmm. because like you mentioned, these small towns aren't quite uh, equipped to handle such a a horrific crime. But you also could find in those situations, there's a reluctance to want to reach out because they want to prove that they can solve it. And so I'm really, really uh, impressed by how they're handling it so far. Uh, The holdback evidence is not only to catch real, the real perpetrator of the crime, but also to weed out cranks and false confessions. Yeah, for sure. There were several false tips in this case. One was a letter claiming to be from the murderer, but we are unable to find any information that indicates it actually came from Taylor's killer. RCMP claimed it was part of the investigation and left it at that. Yeah, p- the, these individuals are the lowest of the low. I can't believe somebody would 
It Take happens. advantage of that moment. And that it happens so many times. So many times. It's just, I can't imagine being so pathetic in life that you've got to try to troll. I, it's like an arsonist. It's the same yeah. kind of idea. Yeah. Like just set something on fire to watch it burn. Yeah. Yeah. You know? and, that, and that's what these guys are doing. They're, they're setting people's hopes on fire, essentially. Well, is it, what just happened with that missing kid who turned out to not be that missing kid yeah. who was found, like with that the poor family. Yeah. It's an awful thing to yeah. have to go through a false lead and get your hopes up and, and it turns out it's just some person being a dick. Yeah. Getting his crank on. Just, yeah. Despicable. Yeah. The material that had been so meticulously collected from under Taylor's fingernails was sent off for analysis. Police hoped against hope it would contain not only Taylor's DNA, but that of her murderer as well. Oh, God, please. In the last week of November, a press conference was held which contained some shocking revelations. Here's some audio of the press conference from Castanet News coverage of the event with Corporal Dan Moskaluk speaking on behalf of the police. Hmm. The RCMP investigative team from the Southeast District Major Crimes Unit have now announced that they have profiled DNA evidence against the person who killed Taylor Van Dies. This DNA evidence is from an unknown male. The investigative team is also announcing that this suspect DNA evidence matches the suspect DNA evidence from a sexual assault which occurred in Kelowna in April of 2005. The Kelowna sexual assault remains unsolved at this time. This suspect DNA sample is not contained within the known offender DNA data bank. So what this means is, is investigators can confirm the match. However, they do not have the outright identity of the person at this time. RCMP investigators are working hard to identify this man, although they would appreciate any assistance the public can provide to help them identify this individual. Oh. So Taylor's last efforts at fighting off her attacker were helping police close in on the murderer. She had scratched DNA from him as she struggled. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm always impressed and, and uh, it, odd to say proud of the victims when they're able to help catch their predator. Yeah. And it must be very frustrating for the police when you've got the DNA but no match. It's yeah, got to be like, no oh, match. we've got the answer. Oh, but we can't we can't completely put it together yet. And another unsolved crime, which indicates that this person is a predator. Yes. So there's a pattern starting to emerge. And likely multiple uh, unreported from this individual. I doubt it's just these two cases. Moskaluk went on to reveal that the sexual assault in Kelowna was against an escort who was working in the Garden of Eden massage parlor at the time of the incident. Mm. But as that case was yet unsolved, no other detail was given about that assault. Thanks to witnesses from the 2005 assault, however, RCMP were able to obtain a description of the suspect. Here's Moskaluk again, giving a description of the suspect. Today we are releasing the composite drawing of the suspect. As a result of our investigation, we were able to compile this composite drawing. Please note that this drawing is of the suspect as he appeared in 2005. The man is described as follows, Caucasian male with darker skin tone, at the time in 2005 believed to be between 19 to 20 years of age, making him today between 25 and 26 years old. He has darker eyes, possibly brown, with short, dark hair. He's between 5'8 and 5'10, with a stocky build, but was described as not being particularly fit or muscular. Now again, as you can see on the composite drawing of the man here depicted in 205, he had large, distinct sideburns and noticeably thick eyebrows. Yeah. Muskalak went on to say that police believed the suspect lived in the Okanagan and was familiar with the area. They asked the public for help, giving a brief behavioral profile of the suspect and how he may have been acting prior to and after the crime. Here's some more audio. We asked residents of the Okanagan to think back to the days just prior to Taylor's murder on Halloween night to see if they recall some form of conflict or personal upset on the day or days leading up to Halloween. Now this may include 
financial pressures, relationship pressures, job loss, or other serious life stressors that may have manifested themselves visibly. Immediately following the homicide, this young man may have also had unexplained visible scratches to his face, neck, or arms as a result of the contact with Taylor Van Dies. There may have also been changes to his regular routine that would be noticeable, such as missed appointments for school or work, or personal commitments. Friends, family, or associates would have also likely observed noticeable changes in his mood on or around Halloween night, which may have included a withdrawal or loss of interest in his usual activities, changes in appetite, changes in sleep pattern, increased use of alcohol or drugs, or changes in his personal grooming hygiene habits. Although we believe he is a resident of the Okanagan Valley, he may have had an unplanned and unexplained departure from the area shortly after the murder on Halloween night. Now, this individual may be financially dependent on others, or he could be collecting social assistance. Based with this information here, again, we ask anyone in the public, if you have suspicions of someone you know, but have been reluctant to this point to come forward, please help us. We're learning a lot about police work in this one. Yeah, I, again, constantly impressed here. Yeah, contact information was given and the information poured in from people uh, who thought they might know something. Over the ensuing months, over 1,250 tips came in, each one being run down by the team of RCMP and investigators assigned to the case. I mean, if you think about the population, five to 10,000 people, that's a lot of tips. It's a hyper, you've got a yeah. Almost a tenth of the population. And it's tips coming in from all over. Yeah, people may be saying, oh, I think I saw him out, you know, yeah. Residents of Armstrong and the rest of the Okanagan were a little more cautious, traveling by car or in groups more often as Taylor's killer was still on the loose. Mm -hmm. According to the profile and his history, this wasn't the first time the man had acted out, and it might just be a matter of time before he struck again. Yeah, I can see why, uh the locals would be terrified. At the end of December, Castanet reported that members of the RCMP Southeast District Major Crimes Unit were in Cherryville, B.C. to investigate a lead. No arrests were made at the time. Hmm. And I mean, they'd been running around a lot of places, so maybe the reporters caught wind of something. Hmm. Residents of the small towns of Lumbee and nearby Cherryville had called in at least 30 tips saying that the composite looked exactly like someone they knew. Okay. His name was Matthew Stephen Forster. Hmm. There's the three names, Scott. Yeah. Yeah, right. (laughs) You know, that's the big joke. How do you know when we're talking about... Uh, a suspect is when we actually say his his three names. Shit, Mike, I'm Scott Douglas Hammond. Oh, there you go. Oh, God. Forrester fit the profile police had given, and his appearance matched that of the individual from the April 12, 2005 sexual assault of the escort in Kelowna. Yeah. Yep. Police learned that Matthew had left his suite in a hurry in November of 2011, asking his landlord for his damage deposit back. Mm. So fit in that uh, M.O., that... The the profile. Yep. Forster left behind all his stuff. Yep. Two women came by and packed all his belongings into boxes. Forster's dad later picked up the boxes. So that's somebody fleeing uh, in a hurry. Yeah, so why had he left so suddenly? Well, you know, the, only a few reasons people flee like that. Uh, you know, family emergency, uh, fleeing. <laughs> or... His father, Stephen, who was known to the RCMP, claimed Matthew had gone north in Alberta to work in the oil fields. He had gotten a job that he couldn't miss out on. And he had to be there in the next hour. I guess so. Wow. Stephen's criminal record, this is the dad, stretched all the way back to 1969 when he'd been arrested for auto theft. Okay. Runs in the family. There were other convictions for drugs and escaping custody. Oh. And his latest conviction had been in 1996 for having a restricted weapon and growing marijuana. Okay. After this first bit of investigation into Matthew Forrester, police became very interested in him. Yeah, I bet. 
things were not adding up alibi-wise, and other evidence would soon come to light. Yeah, I, I love hearing these things where, again, it's it's the information that the police put out there. Good old-fashioned police work. Yep, and, and uh, that is what appears to be leading them in the right direction. Right. I, I love that. A search warrant was obtained for Matthew's cell phone records on the night of Taylor's murder. Rogers provided a copy of the calls and text messages from Matthew's phone, as well as the cell towers that it had connected to that night. Rogers is a local uh, cell company. Across Canada. Yeah, 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 not local. It showed that Matthew Forrester's phone had been in Lumbee in the afternoon, then around the time of the assault, had been in Armstrong. Hmm. Then again in Lumbee after the crime. Well, all signs pointing to Matthew so far. It's unreported how police obtained a sample of Matthew Forster's DNA, but they did. And sure enough, it matched that found under Taylor's fingernails and that from the 2005 crime scene. Hmm. They knew they had their man, but where was he? Great question. Matthew's father was hiding something and the cops knew it. He was the key to Matthew's whereabouts. Oh, shit. A man told police that he had sold Matthew's dad, Stephen, his BCAA card, driver's license, an out-of-date bank card, and his social insurance number for $500 and the promise they would only need it for a few months. Oh, I'm getting pretty angry here. Police began tapping Stephen's pay-as-you-go cell phone, and sure enough... He was talking with yep, Matthew. Yep. He was also working on getting Matthew a whole new identity through another contact in Kelowna. In late March, police heard a conversation about Matthew's location. He was in Collingwood, Ontario. He'd obtained a job at a glass factory using the false ID and even switched a couple of numbers in the SIN when applying for the job so he wouldn't get caught. Matthew bragged about his new photo ID from work, showing the other man's name under his picture. Oh, jeez, these criminals are so smart. Stephen, not really. Yeah, that was facetious. <laughs> Stephen told Matthew to hang on as his brand new identity would be available soon. But father also instructed son that perhaps now is the time to ditch the cell phones. Hmm. His spidey sense told him that the cops were getting closer, but little did he know how close they actually were. Yeah. They were listening. Seeing this as their opportunity, police in Ontario arrested Matthew Stephen Forster in his Collingwood Hotel. They took his father, Stephen Roy Forster, into custody in Cherryville at his home. Good. While in custody, Stephen blabbed to an undercover cop in a cell about how he'd given his son money, a new idea, ID, and advice on how to elude police. Yeah, they're just beyond stupid. Cracking Matthew might take some time. Matthew was flown back to B.C. to face the music. His interview with police went on for hours before, eventually, under the weight of the evidence, he confessed. Hmm, interesting. Here's some audio from a global news report on the case containing a bit of Matthew's confession. Oh. Police and prosecutors had some very strong evidence to prove Matt Forrester murdered Taylor Van Deest on Halloween 2011. His cell phone records put him in the vicinity of Armstrong that fateful night. Forrester's DNA was found under one of Van Deest's fingernails. She scratched his neck trying to defend herself. And her DNA from blood transfer stains was found in Forrester's pickup truck. And this RCMP interview helped seal the deal. Forrester confessing to the killing. Look me in the eye. Tell me this. Do you feel bad for killing Taylor? Yes. Forrester saying he felt sick about what he had done and knew he had a problem. After that happened with Taylor, I, I said to myself, I promised myself I wasn't going to do anything more. Forrester going on to say, I feel like I'm a good person, I just messed up. It was after this interview that the charge against Forrester was upgraded from second to first degree murder because Forrester admitted to police he attacked Van Deest for a sexual purpose. You told me that you went for sex, and that if she hadn't fought you, you wouldn't have killed her, right? Is that all truthful? Yeah. Is it, honestly? Yeah. So except for when I'm, I'm killing people, I'm a good person. Yeah. My God, the audacity. 
During his interviews, Matthew gave more information about what had happened that night. From court documents, quote, Mr. Forster traveled from Enderby to Armstrong on the afternoon of October 31st. He parked his truck in Armstrong and was walking around town. At approximately 6 p.m., he was walking on a road near railroad tracks when he noticed Miss Van Deest. He followed her onto the tracks. He claims to have talked to her for what seemed like a few minutes. He then pushed her to the ground, telling her to keep quiet. She did not comply with his demand, and Mr. Forrester just freaked out. Mr. Forrester gave limited details of the assault on Miss Van Deest, although he admitted that he had caused her injuries. He did state that he hit her more than once with a sturdy metal flashlight and that he was involved in what he called a scuffle with her that took them away from the railroad tracks to the bushes where she was found. He also admitted that he choked her first with his hands, something which would have been expected to cause bruising, but of which forensic pathologists found no evidence, and then with a shoelace. He then fled the scene, leaving Miss Van Deest injured and almost certainly unconscious. At some point later on, it's not clear when, Mr. Forster disposed of the flashlight, the shoelace, and his coat in a dumpster in Vernon, several kilometers from Armstrong. Huh, so, okay. He also elaborated that he had gone to Armstrong looking specifically for sex. He'd been drinking that night, and he was smoking weed. So one thing that stands out in the confession there is he used his shoelace to choke her, but he was saying that he had no intent on killing her. But like from a, he, that shoelace must have been out already. I can't imagine when you've got somebody fighting for their life, you taking the time to take a shoelace out of your shoe. That's a great point, Scott. Uh, I'm thinking that he must have had that already done before he approached her. Unknown. Well, he so, hasn't admitted to that. But it shows premeditation. Because, yeah, like you imagine, you got somebody fighting for their life. And you're like, oh, just hey, give me a second here. Going to take the Just let me take the shoelace out. out. Yeah. Hmm. In March of 2014, two and a half years after Taylor's murder, Matthew Forster finally stood trial for the crime. After a few weeks of emotional testimony from some of Taylor's friends and her boyfriend, Matthew Stephen Forster was found guilty of first-degree murder and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 25 years. Good. Good. Taylor Van Deese's mother and father reacted to the first-degree murder conviction outside the courthouse after the sentence was handed down. Here's some audio from Global News at that moment. Oh, it's going to be sad. The 18-year-old's family say they will never get closure for the loss of their loved one, but believe justice has been served. We'll never bring her back, but we're just happy that that animal is, is going to be off the streets for a very long time. I don't think a person ever heals completely from something like this. Um, there's never closure, um, yeah, because we'll never have Taylor back. Parents should never have to go through something like this, you know, with uh, somebody like that out in the streets. So it has a lifted a fair bit of weight, but it's never, like they say, never going to bring my daughter back. Since her murder in Armstrong, Halloween is a night where residents honor Taylor Van Deest. In most first-degree murder cases, the charge is usually plea bargain to second degree or manslaughter. But Taylor's murder shocked so many. It took away innocence in this community. Matthew Forrester will not be able to apply for parole for 25 years. His lawyer won't say if there will be an appeal. It's a credit to the Crown Prosecutor, the RCMP investigators who gathered the evidence, and the jury that they delivered the toughest murder conviction on the books in Canada. Brian Coxford, Global News. Oh, it always hurts my heart hearing the parents have to talk about a murdered child. Yeah. Oh. A month later, Stephen Forster, Matthew's father, pled guilty to and was sentenced for his part in hiding Matthew after Taylor's murder, knowing full well what Matthew had done. Oh, pisses me off. Here's a Global News report including Marie Van Dies' reaction to the sentencing of Stephen Forster. Well, they say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, and in this case, I think it's, um, it's definitely true. Um, I think they're both cowards. They're both deviants. While both Crown and defense agreed on three years, the judge only reluctantly agreed, saying Mr. Forrester must have known young ladies in Ontario were being put at risk. He knew Matthew was a stone-cold killer. For all Stephen Forrester knew, Matthew was going to kill again. 
That really bothers me. I was really, really just um, bouncing up and down inside when I heard him say that and, you know, just sort of put a little spark of hope in me, but it was soon dashed, so. But he will be doing federal time, so, you know, that's a relief. Um, it's better than no time. Forrester will actually spend just over two years in prison. His sentence was reduced by 11 months as credit for time already served. Randy Neal, Global News. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, this guy, the, the father pisses me off incredibly. I can understand uh, sus if you suspect it's your child and not wanting to believe it and you just live in denial, uh, but yeah. knowing what your child has done. That's unacceptable. And what could happen to other people. Unacceptable. Sometime later, Matthew Forster was charged and pled guilty to the 2005 sexual assault on the escort at the massage parlor. But in the meantime, another prior assault had come to light. Aha. Uh -huh. Here's a Global News report on that. I knew it. Six years before Van Deest was killed, Matt Forster used a knife to rape an escort agency worker in Kelowna. And six months before that sexual assault, Forrester, wearing a face mask and packing a BB gun pistol, attacked his Cherryville neighbor as Kaylee Paul was alone at home and asleep. He grabbed her out of her bed and threw her against the wall twice, like her head hit the wall enough to split it open. Saying he wanted her, Forrester ordered the teenager to come with him before he got scared and took off. I thought I was going to die when he pulled out his gun. I, was, I felt like he was going to kill me. Today, a sobbing Kaylee Paul told the court she will never be the person she was before the attack, saying, I suffered severe emotional trauma. I was constantly frustrated, stressed, emotional, disgusted, angry, and very scared. It seems I will never completely move on from this horrible experience. Forrester is now admitted to attacking Paul and sexually assaulting the other woman in Kelowna. We don't like to use the word plea bargaining, but that's, uh, that's what it is. The judge agreed to a joint submission by the Crown and defense lawyers that Matt Forrester be sentenced to six years for each of the two crimes he pleaded guilty to today. The prison terms to be served concurrently instead of consecutively to his life sentence with no chance of parole for 25 years for the murder of Taylor Van Deest. Unlike the, uh, the U.S. where they stack uh, sentences one on top, life sentences one on top of the other, uh, in Canada a life sentence just means that. Uh, Mr. Forrest will be subject to a, uh, a life sentence on the, the murder conviction uh, for the rest of his life. So uh, the sentence today was concurrent because that's the only thing it can be. But Kaylee Paul's mother thinks Forrester's three prison sentences should be stacked on top of each other. They brutally assaults women and he's killed one and she's lost her life. And he's still out there, and he'll be out, and possibly. He's eligible for parole in 2037. So it's, to me, it's not a fair uh, justice system. But the prison system has its own justice system. Matthew Forrester is being held in a maximum security prison, spending 21 hours a day in super protective custody, so the general population inmates can't get at him to inflict their brand of punishment. Blaine Gaffney, Global News, Kelowna. So there you go. So now he's he's been convicted of three separate violent incidents, and yeah. one of which was a murder. This guy is a predator, and he was. You notice each assault got worse. I I feel so confident that had he not been caught, and with his father's support in hiding him. He absolutely would, would have, have done it again. Absolutely. absolutely. Yep. And, and when, once he's killed, it's not going to be such a scary thing anymore. And so it very easily could kill again. Like, oh, God. As it seems with many of the cases we cover, a conviction does not necessarily mean the end of the story. Yeah. In 2016, Matthew Forster's lawyers filed an appeal on his behalf in his first degree murder trial claiming errors were made by the original trial judge in instructions to the jury. Here we go again. Holy shit, didn't we just go through this? Yep. <laughs> the appeal court agreed, and a new trial was ordered and set for 2017. It was looking like the Van Deese would have to go through yeah. it all again. Yeah, just the worst. 
Here's a global news report of the reactions to the second trial and a twist, but not much of a surprise. I'm kind of numb, really. I, I try not to think about it. I, I try to keep that image out of my head as much as possible. Um, it's just too hard to, to think about. Matthew Stephen Forrester was later convicted by a jury of first-degree murder. When we got that text message, like I think everyone's hearts just dropped and we were just, the anxiety was through the roof. And But at least we got the best outcome we could have gotten under the circumstances. But Forrester appealed his conviction, and because of mistakes by the trial judge in his final instructions to the jury, Forrester was granted a new trial. Crown Counsel did a phenomenal job the first time round, and I'm just as confident that um, we'd walk away with another first-degree conviction. But that is not going to happen. Matthew Forrester's retrial was set for May 28th here at the Kelowna Law Courts. But a new court date has been set for March 12th when Forrester will forego his right to that second trial. According to court registry documents, Forrester intends to plead guilty. Taylor Van Deest's mother says in a plea bargain deal between prosecution and defense lawyers, Forrester will admit to second-degree murder. Of course, we're not happy, says Marie Van Deest. Just the idea of second degree on the table is beyond comprehension to us because we know full well what he did. Justice is flawed. Van Deest says she's been told when Forrester is sentenced in April, the plea bargain calls for parole ineligibility to be set at no less than 17 years. Forrester's original sentence for first degree murder was a minimum 25 years behind bars. Blaine Gaffney, Global News, Kelowna. Oh, good God. We just went through this frustration in the yeah. last uh, Rena Verk episode. And, Ultimately, uh, Matthew Forster was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole for 17 years for his plea bargain of second-degree murder. And of, likely won't get parole, but still. But, po- here's the thing. This is yeah. what I was thinking about. Yeah. Why do all these appeals happen? You know, uh, if you did, if you did it. And, and especially you're going to admit it. If you did it, isn't the best way to show that you're contrite and capable of taking responsibility for your crime is to take your fucking punishment. Excuse my French. Yeah, well, these individuals have a complete disregard for anybody else's life. So they're not contrite. They won't be contrite. All they think about is them. All they think about is what's going to be in their benefit. And they might say, I'm sorry, this I did this. They might, but no, no. They they they're not contrite. They're no. not. They're just selfish assholes. Yeah. So he's gonna get out. Well, I doubt it. I doubt it. Who knows? He he yeah. looks like he's a very dangerous individual. Yeah. And dangerous to young women for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So seventeen years from that point, I mean, he's he's not as old as I am. Yeah. You know, he's he's a younger man than I am right now. Yeah. When yeah. he gets out of jail. Yeah. But again, I, I and in my I might be I might be naive, but I I, I believe they're not gonna let him out. Well, we can always hope. Yeah, well that's what I'm gonna do. Hope. One last note. In the summer of two thousand thirteen, the Taylor Jade Van Deest Memorial Trail opened in Armstrong. The property that the trail was on where she had been walking that night was donated by the Kelowna Pacific Railway to the city. Oh. The trail was paved, a safety fence was put in, flowers were planted, and the area is much safer for for residents to walk at night. Taylor's family was there, and her twin sister, Kirsty, officially opened the trail, cutting the purple ribbon. That was Taylor's favorite color. Mm. Taylor's mom, Marie, was instrumental in making the trail a safer place for everyone in light of what happened to her daughter there. A little ray of sunshine after something so terrible. Yeah. Jeez. This is a heartbreaking case. It really was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I remember when it happened and it was quite terrifying uh, because, again, you small town and it got a lot of publicity uh, out here in, in Vancouver and everything. Mm-hmm. But you've got this small town. Pretty girl. Uh, a, a pretty girl um, yeah. bludgeoned and murdered. On yep, Halloween by a stranger. night, by a stranger who wasn't caught for months. Yeah. So, without a doubt, that's just going to uh, instill such fear. Yeah, 
I yeah, like we've mentioned before, when the lady was murdered here across the street from us, uh, yeah, um, few Ju- years Julie back, yeah. Pascal. It was there was a real sense of fear here in this community uh, until that person was caught months later. Yeah, I can remember having the the day after that happened, I had to get up at six a.m. to make it into work, and was driving in. It was a Sunday, but I, I was still just scared just shit. It was just, I, I, I couldn't sleep on like, all I was thinking about is just, just me going from my, my home to the car. I was thinking about like, what if something and the person sees me and just like, is I wasn't worried for myself to tell you the truth. I was more worried for, uh, women in the yeah. community yep. who this, this person clearly targeted a woman. Yep. Uh, so I was worried for my wife. I was worried for your wife. You know, people who I know and care about, yeah. it r- directly hit us here. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. I remember us talking about it over at your place. Oh, all, yeah. All our, our whole family together talking yeah. about it. It was it was quite... It was a, terrifying. It was yeah. terrifying. Yeah. We've had a few murders around here. <laughs> Welcome to Surrey. Yeah. That's it for this week's case. The reason why I was so compelled with this one is because it's very recent. Yeah. A few of the things in it are very recent, but it was an excellent example of, as you mentioned earlier, old-fashioned police work yep. that let's track this killer down and, yep. and, you know, go to the ends of the earth to find him. And and it was good folks turning in somebody. Well, it, 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 just how quickly she was found, sadly, yeah. by friends. Yeah. I'm and sure family that, and yeah, mom. Uh, I'm sure that'll be something none of them can ever get over Hmm. but again just how quickly everything unfolded and and they were able to find her and be there for her in those last moments yeah yeah whether she was aware that they were there or not is is another thing but just the fact that they got to for themselves be there with her yep you know uh that had to mean a lot yeah yeah absolutely absolutely oh that was a tough one before we go, we want to give our usual shout outs to our new Patreon patrons. Woo, woo. Uh, first up, thanks to Kathy Isles from Scotts Bluff, Nebraska. That sounds like an awful place. I, I wouldn't bluff about it. Scotts Bluff. Yeah, I'm not bluffing. It's great. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. James Winchcombe from Doreen, Australia. Hey, James. Thanks. M- yep. Monica DeHaan from. Toma, Wisconsin, oh. or Dahan. Yeah, it's it was, a very Dutch name. Very much. And thanks, Monica. Catherine Cantor from Waterloo, Ontario. Ooh, woo, Waterloo. Brenda Acero from Laval, Quebec. Okay, Laval. I, why do I know Laval so well? It's like there was a hockey player from there. Probably. Probably. Probably a bunch. Yeah, exactly. Danielle Tobert, and we don't know where she's from. At least I don't. New York. Oh, no, New York. Yeah, New York. She's actually uh, related to Stephen Colbert, but uh, just so that she isn't hounded, she changed the spelling. Her name to Tobert. To Tobert, yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah, well, it's it's a way to kind of stay true to your roots and have most of the the name correct. Wow. But yet also kind of be like, yeah, I'm not going to be hounded by all these yahoos. I think you're full of shit. I think you're full of shit. That's totally. Danielle, you got my back, right? Emma Kenny. Uh, I'm not entirely sure where she's from, but is she from Letter Kenny? No, she's not. Okay. No? Okay. No, she's not. But this is a great guess. Okay. No, that's a great guess. Uh, she She's from, you ready? Yeah. You ready? Alaska. Well, someone was from Alaska last time. That doesn't matter. Well, you think there's only one person in Alaska? I think there's only one thought in your no, head. No, Emma, <laughs> two, <laughs> two, Emma is from Alaska. Anchorage? Uh, that's the only place in Alaska I know, so yes. Okay. Yes, uh, Anchorage. And and what does she do for a living? She's a water skier. You wouldn't think that like that would be where you would- So in other words, she's snowmobiles. No, Mike. No, she water skis. Well, what? Where's the water? That bats. I, I don't know. Like I'm not. I I'm. I haven't read her I know, biography. It's not, it's not frozen all year round. It's I, not I, frozen I all year. But you to be a professional water skier, you got to train all year round. So I don't know, man. I don't know. But she's, she's doing in it in the tub. She's. <laughs> A fan at the other end of the tub. A fan in the tub. <laughs> yeah, look at me, water surfing. Don't electrocute yourself. Oh no, Emma. that's yeah. That if you're doing that, it's very hazardous. Yeah. Don't. 
So thanks, Emma. Uh, enjoy your uh, water ski, your professional water skiing career. It's a good gig. Samuel DeCoste from Lloydminster, Alberta. Hey, Samuel. Thank you. They had a big election there yesterday. Yeah, let's not talk about it. Bridget Irving, and she's a new prime minister. What? Here on the show from Guelph, Ontario, wh- where I've mentioned my dad went to veterinary college. I was going to say culinary school. But I don't think that... No, vet- dad did not go to culinary... Well, I mean, you are carving up... Well, there's some truth. Yeah, some animals. some Some parallels. Yeah, I don't think he, yeah. Yeah. No. Anyways. Dad's a good lobster chef. Well, there you go. And he can make a mean steak. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. That's really awesome. So, thank you, Bridget. Thank you. Andrew McGinnis, who we're seeing in our live show and uh, and in the Umber Yard. Yeah. But I don't know where, what Andrew, where he's from or Lebanon. what he does. He's from Lebanon. He's from Lebanon. Yeah, he's Lebanese. Well, that's interesting. It really is. It really is. Is He's Lebanese yep. with the last name McInnes. I know. Like it's, it's a very it's, Scottish last name. I know. They emigrated from Scotland to Lebanon. Oh. Yeah. Well, how about them? When apples? he was three. Or it could even be Irish. I don't know. Well, whatever. But they emigrated there when he was three. What does he do in Lebanon? Ah, he repairs VCRs. <laughs> Are there a lot of VCRs still in well, Lebanon? You know, yeah, they're not quite up to the... Modern yeah, they're day. still listening to ABBA. Yeah, exactly, on their VCRs. Yeah. Yeah. Julie Essen, she's from Reston, Virginia. Well, that kind of rhymed. Yeah, right? <laughs> Julie Essen from, from Reston. <laughs> and Teresia Y. Murray. Oh. She upped her pledge to PM as well. I Holy guess she crikey. was so impressed that I uh, pronounced her name correctly before. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Well, you know. Well, maybe try pronouncing more names correctly. We'll get more PMs. I guess. Yeah, that's going to be tough, though. Crystal de Duchess from Lockport, New York. It sounds like they got shit locked down there. She's got, yeah, shit's locked down. Yeah, great. Great job, Crystal. Erin Siestra. I don't know where she's from. Yeah, though. yeah, yeah. She's from Turkey. It's very, very uh, Middle Eastern themed. We're going to Turkey now? Yeah, she's in Turkey. Yeah. What's she doing in Turkey? Working and living, Mike. What else would you do I in Turkey? I guess so. What else would you do, do in Turkey? Well, that's a good question. I don't know a lot about... <laughs> yeah, that one stumped I don't me. know a lot about Turkey. Well, Turkish people live there. Yes, I'm yeah. aware. Yeah. A Turkish delight is a delicious snack. I'm not sure that uh, that's even actually related to Turkey. How could it not? It's got Turk in its name. <laughs> Big Turk, the chocolate bars, probably also uh, originates from there. And man, it's one of my favorite chocolate bars. You know you're not well. No, I've, yeah, no, like clinically diagnosed yeah, you know, oh, yeah. scooters. Yeah. Things are bad. Yeah, things are, well, good, but it's in my head. Jeffrey Bolak from Chandler, Arizona. Uh-oh. Mark Butler from Callinger, Australia. Hey, Mark. That's an interesting Callinger. 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 Stephanie Graves from that other Vancouver in Washington. Yeah, that's the the imposter Vancouver. Near Mount St. Helens. Yes. 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 I was L- just talking to somebody about that the other day. I want to go there again. I got some good pictures, but... You've been? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, I've been shit. Twice. I would love to go. I'd love to go to Mount St. Helens. We should go down there. It's only yes! a six-hour drive. Let's do it. <laughs> and then we got a pledge from someone whose name is simply A. Yeah, the letter A. The letter A. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know you know where they're from? The beginning of the alphabet. Sesame Street. <laughs> no, from from Se- Sesame Street. From Sesame Street. The, does this person work in Mr. Hooper's store? He, he does. Or she. I'd be careful. We don't know how, we don't want to assume genders this here. This is stuff. true. This is true. Well, but as. They. As, as the count would say. Uh, uh, uh. Hey. Uh, 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 uh. uh okay. Fair enough. Yeah. So. A is from Sesame Street. There you go. Yeah. Jessica Brown from Lethbridge, up to pledge. Sweet. Thank you, Jessica. Dr. Heidi Beverine Curry from Syracuse, New York, who follows us on Twitter and has a PhD in reading education and some other smarty pants credentials, is also now a patron. Dr. Heidi... Why are you listening to us with all those smarts? <laughs> and that's what I I asked her on Twitter today, and I said uh, I'm very flattered. Yeah, that uh, she you must would, you would uh, grace us with your patronage. 
You would, However, I felt very stupid writing that you, tweet. I would think somebody with the moniker doctor in front of their name would just be full of frustration every second listening to us like, no, that's wrong. No, you can't. That's gr- gr- grammatically. That's not even correct. No, God damn. Uh. I even sent her a gift saying I'm not an idiot. <laughs> I don't know if that's true or not, but I, I sent yeah, I, it's true that I sent it to her. I don't know if it's bite, actually gonna bite my tongue. Factual. Gonna, Thanks, Scott. Gonna bite my tongue on there. Thank you so much to our patrons, past and present, for your pledges. We really appreciate your support of the show. Hell yeah. Uh if you want to help support the show, you can do so at patreon.com slash dark poutine. Or for a single support of the show, you can send us some donut money at PayPal via our email address darkproteinpodcast at gmail.com. And we didn't get any donut, donut money this week. That's oh, okay. Shit. We got a bunch last week. Well, uh, I ate some donuts today, though, in preparation for donut money. Son of money. a bitch. Yeah, I shouldn't. So now you're, we're, we're in the we're, hole. We're, we're in donut debt. We're in the donut hole. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. See where I went? I do. I do. I, I, threw, I threw the pitch pretty pretty yeah, good you there. loved and, it and you hit a homer there <laughs> i did wow right out of the park donut, we're in the donut hole we're in the donut hole <laughs> if you don't already it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe to the show i don't know why you would after this <laughs> you can easily find us on itunes podcast google play stitcher tune in spotify or wherever you get your on-demand audio check out our website darkpoutine.com for show notes and other notes and other cool stuff please give us a follow or a like on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Just search for Dark Poutine. Tell your friends about us. Join our many, now many, <laughs> Facebook groups. <laughs> the Yumber Yard. The that's Barn the o- Yard. The o- Yumber Yard's the OG Yard. Yeah, the that's the original yard. If you join the Yumber Yard, you have automatic, uh, you can automatically join the Barn Yard or the Craft Barn. Yeah, the Craft Barn. The yeah, Craft yeah. Barn went from zero to 250 members in about an hour. Yeah, yeah. I suspect we're going to get more yards. <laughs> But it's it's kind of cool. I I like that we're just pre- creating a, a pretty awesome community for people to just talk and share about what they like. It's really fun. Yeah, I'm really I'm really digging how 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 widespread that's uh, taken off there. Well, there you go. There you go. That's it for this week, folks. As I say every week, don't forget to be a good egg and not a bad apple. Bye bye, everybody. Good night. Guten Tag or good morning. Or good day. Good afternoon. Bye. Bye.